So I hope we all take this seriously that we would want to say I want to memorize it, I want to be able to teach it. So try to remember this, uh, this teachings and also try to be able to answer the questions. Okay now, um, so we go through this again and then, but now it's the questions. The first part, essential qualities of people who serve God, relationship with God, so the first part. And then this Bible verse, Jesus said, He who abides me, in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now, I hope we all, when we read the Bible verse, then we can explain it. So, the question is, if a person who serves God does not have a close relationship with God, what will happen? What will happen? And so, we look at the Bible verse, it says, without me, without Jesus, you can do nothing. So, when Christians, when ministers don't have a close relationship with God, they can do nothing. But people say they, they can still do a lot of things. But those things don't have the strength from God and don't have the power from God and they don't have the power to change people. And there are people who just teach from the mind. It's just from the mind. It's not from the spirit. But if the whole person is connected to God and have the strength from the Lord, then they live in Christ and Christ live in them and then they will bear much fruit and people will be changed and people will be touched by those words. So that's the first question. People without a close relationship with God will be serving God in weakness. And so I hope we all realize that there is no way to run away from God. We all have to face God. And if we are not faithful, then, uh, then we have no strength. And then Psalm 90, verse 14, O oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. How can we serve God joyfully? Why do many people serve without joy? So when we want to explain how can we serve God joyfully, here it says that satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So we need to satisfy ourselves with God's mercy. It's not just knowing, it's not just knowing God's mercy. It is being satisfied, being satisfied with, uh, with, with God's mercy. What does it mean being satisfied? That we always praise God and love God and think about the blessings of God. And then we say, God is loving me and I can enjoy God's presence. I'm strengthened by God's presence. So I can enjoy this presence. So I'm satisfied. I'm filled with the presence of God. And then that will give us joy. So when every day we say, God is blessing me, hallelujah, God is with me. God is blessing me, God is strengthening me. Then we'll have strength all the time, all our days. Hallelujah. So how can we serve God joyfully? To be filled with His love. So here it talks about the motivation is from love. It's not from the law. It's not just saying, I have to do it, but it's from the, the mercy of God. And then why do many people serve without joy? Because a lot of times people think they are just, you know, carrying the burdens of the whole church. They have to make the church grow. They have to make sure people follow God and love God. So when people don't love God, they will, uh, they will say, you don't love God, you don't obey God, and you are sinning. It's just rebuking. We do rebuke sometimes when people don't repent after we guide them. But we want to first guide them and say, you are important. Remember, motivation with the grace of God. You are important. Your life is precious. If you follow God, your life will go higher and higher. You bless many people. So do you want to go higher and higher in your life? If you want to, then love God and follow God and obey Him and turn away from sins. And then God is very happy. Every step you take, God is very happy. So motivate people with God's love. And then people will say, wow, I didn't realize it's possible. It's possible to please God. Then, you know, they'll say, oh, today I did love God. Today I prayed to God. So God is happy with me. Then they will feel happy and we'll be happy too with them. So I hope we all will be serving in joy, as serving in love, as in uh, uh, the verse here that satisfy us early with the mercy that we live in His mercy and His love, and then we can be filled with joy all the time. Okay, the relationship with God here, Matthew 25, 21. So every time you say a question, please think for yourself, how will you answer it? Well then, good and faithful servant. 
So why are the two qualities important, good and faithful? Why are they important and what are they? Good means it's a, a life of kindness, of love, of care, of submission and humility. It's the good qualities of life. And then faithful means being faithful to do everything God has taught us to do, including the relationship with God, relationship with people, with family, and then serving God. Now the priority is first the relationship with God, and then bear fruit from our life and bless people and fulfill our responsibilities. As ministers, we want to fulfill our, min uh, our responsibility in the family and everywhere. And then we serve God. So everything done. And then the last is to serve God in the, in the ministry. Now it doesn't mean it's not important. It's important. But we want the life to be complete before we serve God. And then Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Why are there people who serve God, prophesy in Jesus' name and cast out demons and do many wonders and are rejected by the Lord? So this passage I don't show here. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, maybe you know this passage already, that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And there will be many people who say, I prophesy in your name, cast out demons, and do many wonders. But Jesus said, truly I say to you, I don't know you. So when here it talks about people who don't follow God's perfect will, when they don't obey God, even when they do ministry, now, you might say, well, doing ministry is obeying God's word. It's true. But first is the life obedience, the obedience of the life. It means what? It means trusting in God, loving God, obeying God in our daily life, that we don't tell lies, we don't uh, hate people, we forgive people, we love people, we care about people, and then we glorify God, we uh, fulfill our responsibilities, as being a Christian and, and be faithful in everything. So this is being, you know, following God's will. It's not just doing ministry. So some people can be preaching, but after they preach, they go home and they yell at their family members. Then they're not obeying God's word. And there is a danger. If a person just preaches, but then he sins a lot, then there is a danger that he could be, you know, not obeying God at all. So we want to... Uh, have a close relationship with God and obey Him in every way, to glorify Him in every way. And then we serve God. And then what we do will be accepted by the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if we don't have this spirit, the spiritual life then just doing ministry, just preaching, casting out demons could mean that all these works are rejected and also His life could be rejected. And then personal qualities of people who serve God. Here it talks about humility. John 3.30 He must increase, but I must decrease. Now this is when uh, people told John the Baptist that uh, many people follow Jesus now. They are uh, that He baptized more people than you. And then John the Baptist says, He must increase, but I must decrease. So His ministry is to prepare people for Jesus. His ministry is not for Himself. So Jesus will increase and I must decrease. So the question here is, if a person serves God to raise up his own prestige, his reputation, his acceptance by people, what can happen to him? What does it mean to serve with humility? So if people just want to raise God to raise up his reputation, his, uh, uh, you know, just so that people will say he's a great preacher and he's doing great, his church is great, just to be more famous, what can happen to him? He can be, he's raising himself up. And then God is not happy when people are proud and they want to raise up their reputation. Then God is not happy with that. We want to submit to God and follow God. It's not to glorify us, to glorify, it's to glorify God, not to ourselves. So what does it mean to serve with humility? That we say, Lord, it's your ministry. I submit to you. Whenever God does anything, I will say, this is God's word. Hallelujah. Let's love God. Let's praise God. Instead of saying, wow, see how powerful we are. See how powerful I am. Now, this is wrong. We don't want to say that. 
Because when we do that, then we are canceling our ministry. So we want to serve with humility. And then next question, if a person who serves God lives in sin, what will happen? So if a person lives in sin, what will happen is, uh, Jesus has said, do not sin anymore, lest the worst thing will happen to you. The worst thing will happen. And then, now there are different uh, stages that he will go down. First, his ministry will not be acceptable by God. God is not pleased with his ministry. And the second is, God is not pleased with his life. Gradually, he's not pleased with his life. And then gradually, God even don't have relationship with this person if he doesn't continue this relationship. If we continue relationship, he always continue relationship with us. How do you continue relationship with God? Always repenting. Lord Jesus, please re forgive my sins and help us to love you and obey you and have a close relationship with you. I want to obey you. I want to turn away from my sins and follow you. So that is building the relationship with God. When people are building relationship with God, even when they fail, even when they sin, God will still forgive them. But if they sin and they say, uh, it's okay, you know, stealing some money from the church is okay. Committing adultery is okay, you know. Uh, then he has the danger of first losing his ministry. Next is losing his spiritual life and his salvation. So if a person serves God in sin, he will tear down everything he has done. Okay, and then continue Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Why do many people s serve God with burdens? How can we serve without burdens? Now this verse here, you want to always explain the Bible verse. Come to me, Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. So this is the first kind of rest, is for people to have a relationship with Jesus. And then take my yoke, that means serve God with me. And then learn from me, learn his lifestyle, learn the way he, he has a relationship with God and how he served God. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. So learn his gentleness and his humility. And you will find rest for your souls. And then you have a deeper rest. Now here is the word soul. Is a, uh, that it will, the rest will go into the soul. Now first verse 28, it, it doesn't talk about rest going into the soul. But when we serve God and follow God's way, then the rest will go deep into our soul. Then the person will be relaxed because Jesus said, take all you who are weary and burdened, take my yoke and you'll be you know, relax and you don't have worries and you can serve God with joy and peace. So then we, you know, actually we don't have to worry about the future of the church. We just find out how is the relationship of God, of the people and ourselves. How are we following God in the ministry? Are we bringing people to follow God? If not, how can we change it? And then we just do what is necessary. To build up the relationship and build up people's willingness to serve God and then the church will grow for sure it will grow because when people are motivated and they're full of joy and strength they will grow now if people are not willing to change then we'll tell them that uh, you know God has so many blessings for you and your life is precious are you willing to be changed by God and blessed by God and if people know know that God can bless them but they don't want to follow God then we can uh, after a while, after we encourage them, we can warn them, you know, you can be falling away from God. Do you want that to happen? You know, I don't think most Christians, uh, they intentionally turn away from God. Now, there are some Christians who do that, but most Christians, they don't intentionally turn away from God. It's that they are weak. But if we tell them, if you trust in God, you'll be strengthened. God will be pleased with you. Everything you do, God will be pleased. Then, they will be encouraged and then they can follow God. So we want to tell people that it's not hard to follow God. Then people will change. And then we can serve God with joy and peace. So why do many people serve with, with burdens? Because they're carrying the burdens of the church and they're saying that people are not obeying so they get angry and they get frustrated. They use human effort instead of trusting in God. So it's very important we trust in God's grace 
It's God's grace. It's God's intention to bless the church, so I can relax in Him. And when I when I glorify God and relax, sometimes when we smile and relax, God can see our smile and joy, and then they will be changed by our joy and our strength instead of. Seeing if people see that we are angry, frustrated in our ministry, then people would not have strength from God. So I hope that we all will serve God without burdens, knowing that God is in charge. God will take care of it, so I don't have to worry. Hallelujah. And then Romans twelve fifteen here it talks about rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So he, this verse talk about. Empathy that we feel the feelings of people. Now many people they lose that ability. They because they they become very hard. They, it's always preaching hard. Ah, you have to love God. You have to obey God. You have to serve God. You have to give bring offering. It's always commanding people. They lose that feeling for people. They don't feel the feelings of people. And Paul he is very effective in his ministry and is very diligent. He tell us to. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So, if a person who serves God does not feel the feeling of the people, what will happen? If they don't feel the feeling, what will happen is their preaching doesn't touch people's heart. Their preaching is just intellectual; it doesn't relate to people. But when we feel people's hearts, then we, we, when we talk, we can relate to them. I. You know, I've talked with many people. I've counseled many people, so I know the burdens of lay people. I know the burdens of pastors. So I try to uh, speak to everyone in a way that I understand their problems and needs. And I have gone through that myself. I've gone through the difficulties myself, and how I handle the situation and trusting God and have strength from the Lord. So I understand myself. First, we understand ourselves. Understand our feelings. Why do we feel burdened? We understand our feeling, understand the source of the burdens, and then we can understand the source of burdens of the people, and then we can, you know, relate to them and say, "Oh, I know that it's difficult for you. I know that your life is difficult." When we know that they're difficult, doesn't mean we say it's okay always to have no strength, but we'll tell them, "God has a plan. God has a way to bless you and help you." So we want to trust in God together. We pray together for strength to you, so that you'll be renewed. So we want to feel the feelings of people. When people say, "I'm sorry," "I'm sad," "I'm unhappy," then we'll say,、uh, "Oh, I know it's not easy for you." Instead of saying, many people will say, "Pray, pray, and you'll be joyful." Don't just command people. Don't just tell people what to do. But we can say, "I know it's difficult for you. I know it's." It's difficult at this time, and God cares about you, and I care about you, and、uh, we want to trust God together. Okay, James one nineteen. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Now, so here we talk about swift to hear, quick to hear. If a person who serves God does not listen to people, what will happen? What is the importance of listening? So when people say. Uh, uh, the message doesn't touch our heart. I don't know how to handle this problem. I'm unhappy. Then we don't listen. We just say, "Believe in God." I've seen this response from many people.、Uh, I, everywhere I went, training, we'll have a demonstration. Okay, this person says he's unhappy. What can you say? Then people say, "Well, trust in God, and you won't be unhappy."、Uh, believe, pray, and praise God, and you'll be happy again. That's just instruction. If he Can do that, he will not be in trouble. So we listen and try to understand where they are. I know it's difficult you for you right now. I know it's not easy for you right now. And God wants to bless you. God wants to help you. So uh, uh, let's pray together for the strength from the Lord. I know that it's hard for you. I know that you've been hurt by people. So feel the feelings of people. Don't be harsh. I've seen many harsh pastors. When they preach, they they preach in a harsh way, in a very always in a strong voice. Never personal. We want to preach in a way personal that touch people's heart, and we want to feel the people's feelings. So that our message is not just strong, it's not just telling people what to do, but we tell them how God is loving you and blessing you. Hallelujah. 
Okay, and then the heart to serve the qualities of a minister. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Now, we have gone through these passages already, but why do we go through this again? So that you try to remember, remember, and be able to tell people, be able to preach like this, and I, at the same time point out the mistakes of some people, because some people, it's always commanding, pushing people, and accusing people, even sometimes accusing them that they're not doing well. Okay, what are the differences between serving others and getting something from others? So Jesus came not, uh, not to be served, but to serve and to give His life, a ransom for many. So Jesus came to give His life for people, to give His time to help people, to bless people, not to be served. There are some pastors, they think that now I'm a pastor, so you all just help me, help me. Everyone help me. Uh, uh, and they don't, have no, they don't have the heart to bless a little brother, someone he need, because they think I'm uh, in a high position now. You have to obey me and you have to uh, do the things to please me. You have to submit to me. So then they, are, they want to be served instead of serving other people. So we want to serve people. So the difference between peop serving others and getting something from others. Serving others is to uh, think of the needs of other people. Getting something from others is try to get their support, get their money, get their uh, praise, you know, to get something from people. Matthew 25, 40. Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Why do people sometimes despise unimportant people? How can we have compassion for them? So Jesus said, if you did not do, if you did it to one of these little ones, you have done it to me. So when we bless a little one, we are blessing, uh, we are doing to Jesus and Jesus is very happy. But why do many people despise unimportant people? Because that's nat natural. This person is uneducated, has no money, always a problem, he is dirty. So it's very natural for us to despise. But we want to change by Jesus, that we want to say, even though he's dirty, he's uneducated, he's poor, he has all kinds of problems, he sins a lot, still he's important. I want to bless him and help him. If I can help him, then God is happy with me and this person's life is raised up and raised up and God is very happy with me. So uh, the reason that people despise other people is our sinful nature. How can we have compassion for people? The way is to think about their needs, their problems, their difficulties, and then we can learn to have compassion on them. Number five, why is it important to accept people? How can we accept weak Christians? So to accept people, sometimes some Christians keep sinning many times. And then uh, sometimes ministers lose patience. We want to have acceptance. There are many people who went to heaven and they have sinned a lot. When they went to heaven, they found the most amazing thing they experienced is the acceptance, that Jesus accepts them and the people accept them. So they feel very happy when they are accepted. So we want to accept people too, so they feel like heaven. So when they come to us, they feel like they're going to heaven. So we always say, uh, it's okay, I understand your difficulties and we'll pray for you and we we'll want to bless you and and still accept them and be kind to them. So that's very important. First Peter 5, 2. Shepherd the flock of God, nor as being lords over those, those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Some pastors only emphasize submission of the members. What does this passage teach? How to be submissive to one another. Now, uh, this passage says that shepherd the flock of God not as lords over those entrusted to you. Not, do not serve over them as say, we are their lords, their masters. Yet all of you, all of you including the pastors and the leaders, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. So, verse 2 talk about the shepherd of the flock. And then verse 3, talk about uh, be submissive to one another. So 
We all submit to each other. So what does it mean the pastors submit to each other? They, they will listen to the needs of the people. They would minister to their needs. That is submitting to them. But some pastors just want their way. They just want to preach their sermon, not relating to the people. We want to relate to the people, re respond to their needs, respond to their condition, and care about them. That's what God wants us to do, to submit to them. Of course, the Bible teaches that the members should submit to the pastor who leads them, to, who, who shepherd them. It, it's true, very true. But it, it is not an absolute submission. What, what do I mean by absolute submission? For instance, the pastor cannot say, okay, stop doing the work of your home and come here and do everything here I tell you to do. We have no right to do that. We cannot command the people to do the things we, we want them to do. Uh, if people serve God, it's out of their willingness, but we also want to motivate them, but we don't want to force, force them. And we, we, we don't want to force people to do things in our way. So we, uh, it's not an absolute submission. Now, in a sense that we don't just make them slaves, but we care about them, we listen to their needs, we encourage them to raise them up. But in general, they follow the instruction of the pastors. At the same time, the pastors care about them and, and, and listen to them and bless them. Okay, quality as shepherd. God desires mercy. How can we develop mercy? God desires mercy. God wants mercy. Um, I thank God that God has given me this heart to bless people. I put many videos online and there are people who look for, seek my help. And they don't belong to my church. They might not be in Hong Kong, they are in different countries. And they seek my help. And I continue to help them. And I did not make them come to my church. Uh, so I just have mercy on them without condition. Uh, these people, they have their own church. Let them be faithful in the church. But if I can bless them, I'm doing things to Jesus. And Jesus is very happy with me. So have this heart. These are important people in the sight of God. And when I can bless them, God is happy with me. And God will bless me. So I have the motivation to bless them. Even though I don't get anything back earthly. But I will get heavenly things back. But I don't serve with the purpose of getting something back. I serve with the purpose of just blessing people. I see people's needs. I just want them to, to be happy when I bless them. 1 Corinthians 9.22 To the weak I become, became as weak, that I might win the weak. So here is the attitude of going down to the level of the people. Paul was willing to go down to the level of the people in order to win them. How do we do that? So how can we, what do you mean by to the weak I become as weak? So to the people who are weak, we don't say, I'm very strong, I'm very strong. See, I can do all this thing and then you cannot do it. But we say, you know, I used to be weak too. I have this weakness too, but I overcome it by the help of God. So we all have this sinful nature. So it's not, uh, it's real that we all need the help of God. So we go down to the level and accept their weaknesses. Okay, and then this quality of a shepherd is to listen to people, listen to advice. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Why do some leaders unwilling to accept the opinions of others? What motivates us to accept the opinions of others? So the Bible verse says that the, the way of a fool, fool is right in his own eyes. The fool is saying, what I do is right, this is right, that is right. They're always seeing that I'm right. But he who heeds counsel is wise. But when we listen to counsel, listen to advice, then we are wise. When people give us suggestions and then we listen to it, it doesn't mean we have to listen to do what they suggest every time. Sometimes we don't uh, do what they suggest, but we listen to them and we examine what they say. So why do some leaders and we... Uh, why are some leaders, why are some leaders unwilling to accept the opinions of others? Why are they not willing? Because they think people are not wise enough. Only I'm wise enough. So I don't want to listen to you or I have my own ideas. I, I know what to do. That way they won't listen to people. And sometimes even members say, you know, we are suffering in the church because of this, this problem. We are suffering. How can we do it? And the pastor is still 
uh, you know, didn't listen to the needs and didn't uh, listen to the suggestion of how to uh, help the people, then he's not listening to the people and then he cannot improve. As pastors, we want to improve. And one important element to improve is to listen to people. Now, a lot of, a lot of my teachings, you notice, is from daily life because I listen to people a lot. I listen, I know their needs. I know my own needs. I listen to myself. I know my needs and my, I know other people's needs and then I respond to them. So what motivates us to accept opinions of others? That uh, because people always have the wisdom and people have, they have suggestions that could wake us up. Now, I, I want to uh, share with uh, you all about a real experience of mine. Uh, my wife, you know, before suggests that we go to the beach to take pictures. And then I said, when we go to the beach, the sand, you know, the, uh, the wind will blow the sand and it can go to the camera. And so I said, well, it, it, why, why not go to somewhere else, not go to the beach? But then she said, go to the beach is more romantic. So I agreed to her. And then afterwards, she thought about it and then she talked to me. She's very wise. She would think about it and then after a while, she talked to me. She said, I noticed that when I give you suggestions, very often you talk about the difficulties first. You talk about the sand being blown to the camera. You don't think of the advantage. You, don't, you didn't ask me, why did you think of going to take pictures in, uh, on a beach? What, what is the reason? What, uh, what is special about that? You didn't ask me. You just say, it's difficult. Now, let me ask you, if your wife, your spouse, your children, your members uh, suggest something, do you always say, no, it cannot be done, cannot be done? Do we say no first before we think about it? Before we ask, why do you suggest this? What are the advantages? So I hope that we all learn this, that we want to listen to people's suggestion and ask them why they have this idea. And then if the idea is good, then we say, wow, you're wise. You have this good suggestion. I thank you for that. So many times I appreciate my wife and say, thank you, thank you for the good idea. It's, it's really a good idea. I, I, uh, I want to praise her uh, to let her feel she's important when she, you know, doing things to me that are, you know, I, it's very helpful to me. So I, I say, said to her many times, you're wise, you're happy, you're beautiful, you're joyful, uh, you, you really make me happy and I, I'm happy to be with you. And the other day I said to my wife, M one prayer of, my, of mine to God is that we both die at the same time because I know that if I die first she'll be very unhappy and if she dies first I'll be unhappy and if we die at the same time we'll be going to heaven together and then she said yes and then we'll be going to heaven together so always think of her to make her happy and listen to her listen to her opinions and uh, it, her opinion has made me wiser I thank God for that okay now the next these are questions about principles in ministry. Okay, now um, you can tell me too about, um, let's see, I have to calculate time. Five. Uh, so tell me, you know, when you want a break to send WhatsApp to me. Okay, principles in ministry. If a church worker gossip what will happen so this about not gossiping uh, church workers has to be very careful not to gossip because the gossip will always go back to the person or very often can go back to the original person and then the person will lose trust in the pastor so now um, the church workers need to discuss about people sometimes we need to discuss how to help the person that is not gossiping and then when the church workers discuss, it's just they keep it to themselves. They don't, we don't spread it to other people and say, oh, so-and-so, I heard pastor said that he has this problem. We don't spread to other people. We have to be very careful. Normally, nobody should talk about people's problems. But when church workers or leaders, they want to help someone, they need to talk, uh, discuss how to help the person then it's fine it's because the purpose is not to gossip the purpose is to help the person then it's not gossiping but if people gossip for the sake of you know just for fun usually they gossip for the sake of fun 
they just want to say something bad about other people, then uh, it can destroy the church. There are churches that are split because of this. There are people who leave church because of this. Okay, number two question. When people accuse others, what will happen? Uh, how can we stop accusing people? So another principle is don't accuse people. Now this applies to marriage, to relationship, to, to church ministry. We don't accuse because when people accuse people, people will feel hurt and it can break relationship. Instead, we can guide them. God loves you. God wants to use you. Do you want to go higher? So how can you improve? How can you overcome that problem? Instead of saying, you're always late. You're always sinning. You always, you know, do all these terrible things. Then people feel, you never notice the good things I've done. You always tell me the things I do wrong. Like husband and wife always saying, oh, you didn't listen to me. You didn't do this, do that. Instead, we can say, uh, i like you to listen to me. I, something important and I thank you for listening to me so approach in a positive way instead of saying you didn't do it you can say uh, there's something important I'd like you to do we, we can talk about it together so that way it's an invitation instead of accusation okay number three if a person steals money from the church what will happen how can we prevent that so uh, in handling money in the church, we have to be very careful. If someone steals money from the church, first, he can lose his reward and his salvation. So, as Christians, we never want to do that. People who handle the money never want to do that. Never take money from the church. Always say, uh, I want to... You know, I want to give money to God. I never want to take, steal money from the church. So what will happen is affect the spiritual life and can take away the salvation. And also it will destroy the church. And, and if a pastor, pastor steals money, people can lose hope, uh, lose trust in him and the church can break up. So how can we prevent that? Uh, one way is to have more than one person handle money and if it's a large amount of money have more people counting it together uh, so that nobody can steal the money and the process has to be checked by other people and then four why do sex scandals happen in the church what damage would they bring how to avoid temptation from opposite sex why do sex scandals happen in the church uh, there have been many Christians and pastors who have fallen 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 uh, in the sins of uh, adultery. Why do sex um, scandals happen? Because uh, firstly, there are many lonely people in the church. There are many people who are lonely and they, they want to get satisfaction uh, first from talking to people of, of the opposite sex or just want to find someone to talk to. And then the more they talk, the more they rely on each other. Um, we have to pay attention to relationships that re not rely on each other, depend on each other. When a relationship is depending on each other, is relying on each other, it's already there's a danger. For instance, if someone always wants to talk to someone, want to spend time with the person, and always want the other person to spend time with him, that's a relying relationship. That's already it's going wrong. As pastors, we don't want any female to rely on us. And we don't want to rely on any women to get the feeling of satisfaction. Now, sometimes some women can make pastors feel very satisfied because the women will say, Oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, I like you. I, I like what you say. What you do is wonderful. And the, the, and the attitude make the pastor feel very good. They feel very happy because they are wanted. But their wives don't want them. Their wives is impatient with them. So they, so they say, I like the women in the church more than my wife. Then there's a danger. So we don't want to have this dependence on people in the church. Whenever we notice that, actually, we don't want to give the chance to people. But whenever that happens, we have to stop it. And then uh, for long-term counseling, it's better to, for women to do counseling uh, to women. And then when it's unavo unavoidable, we want to give the responsibility back to the woman. We don't want to counsel them all the time. We want to tell them, okay, 
Now these are my suggestions, go home and do it. And then have some other people follow, follow up on them, not just ourselves. Okay, we'll finish here, the principles in ministry. Number five, what will interpersonal problem do to a church? How to prevent it? How to build up interpersonal relationship? Now, interpersonal problem in a church, it can be like someone says, I don't want to talk to that person. I don't like the person. I, I always yell with the person. The people yell at each other, fight each other, and don't like each other. All these are interpersonal problem. And sometimes it can be more serious that people don't want to see this person or don't want to work together. Or a pastor, they say, I don't like this group of people. They don't listen to me and I don't like them. And I like this group of people that will cause interpersonal problem. What will it do to the church? It can cause the church to split. It can cause people to have a jealousy and anger. So we don't want to, uh, you know, be impartial to people. We want to be fair to people and we don't want to say this group is my favorite and this group I dislike. Uh, and then, and if there is any unforgiveness, it will break up the, the church also. So we want to guide the people and say this unity is very beautiful. So we want to forgive each other. And there, if there are problems of unforgiveness, we have to counsel to resolve the problem. Uh, there are many people, you know, sometimes people told me, oh, and a person has done this to me and I'm very angry with him. I, it's hard for me to talk to him again. And they always want to just tell me and then do nothing. But my response is always saying, I want to talk to both of you together to resolve this. I don't want to accuse anyone, but just talk about what happened. How can we handle it? How can we be good friends again and forgive each other and, uh, so that we have unity? That's very important. So. As pastors, we need to be very wise to handle interpersonal problems and not to create interpersonal problems ourselves. And how to build up interpersonal relationship. Uh, in a church, always give them opportunities to greet each other, to encourage each other, to help each other, and appreciate each other. So everyone learn to appreciate, not to criticize. Now, some people have the habit of criticizing pastors and say, you don't preach well enough. So we need to teach them and tell them, okay, if I don't preach well enough, you can give me suggestion. I can work on it, but I might not be like another pastor. I cannot be perfect, and, uh, but I would try my best. And so instead of criticizing me, you can give me suggestion to improve. And as pastors too, we need to improve. We don't you know, some pastors, they never listen to people. They just preach in a certain way and never listen to the people. So we want to build up the interpersonal relationship, uh, build up trust and care so that people have the habit of caring about, about caring other people. And cell groups is a good way. Cell group is a good way to have people to encourage each other, build up each other. But cell group is not just for socializing with each other. It's also discussing the Word of God, applying the Word of God and helping each other. It's not just socializing with each other. Socializing it means just to say, oh, what happened to me? Oh, this thing, I bought this, I, I did this, I went to, uh, you know, things that happened in the life. It's just talk about that. Uh, just everyone telling story. It's cell group is not for that. Cell group is for encouraging people, building up their spiritual life and building up care and concern. How to handle bitterness in ministry? Bitterness does happen in churches. Unforgiveness does happen in churches. So we want to listen to them. Then we need counseling. We'll talk about counseling in uh, another session. So we want to listen to them. Accept the feeling of both. Uh, you know, usually when there is bitterness, there is problem on both sides. So we want to listen to them and help them to, uh, you know, to verbalize and then verbalize without accusation just saying what happened and how they felt and then how can we uh, handle that feeling how can we overcome that problem um, so that we'll talk about uh, later but then it's very important when we realize there's unforgiveness or bitterness that has it has to be handled if there's a constant bitterness towards someone in the church or toward a pastor the church has a great danger so it has to be resolved. The pastor has to listen to people. There are pastors who don't listen to people at all. They don't. They have problems, but people tell them they don't listen. 
and then bitterness will be built up and then the church can have problem so the solution is not saying you have to submit you have to submit but he has to listen to people and respond to the needs of the people and the feeling of the people and then number seven how do people steal the glory of God how can we stop stealing the glory of God so that's another principle of ministry that sometimes people pray for people and people are you know they experience the Holy Spirit they say wow ah, we are powerful I am powerful oh it's great God is using me God has given me anointing look at my anointing now I have I've seen videos like this that some people say wow Jews fall down heaven look at our ministry now if Jews fall in the ministry that's great we we'll give glory to God wow God you're wonderful well you're wonderful instead of saying see how wonderful our ministry is so don't give glory to the ministry but give glory to God and there are people that I knew that create false signs like that uh, I mean I'm not saying all of them are false but there are false signs one time I went to a church and then the pastor I guess he has this habit He'll open his Bible and say, wow, oil, there's oil, there's oil here. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the side of the church, oh, feel it, all oil, all over, everywhere. I, you know, I, um, I question that. It's, it's like the, the whole church is like this. They always have this oil around and say, this is the anointing oil of God. Now, if that, hap uh, if that happens as a, you know, uh, habitually, the pastor should first in a meeting say, okay, everyone go feel the wall of the church. Is there any oil? No oil. Now, feel my Bible, no oil. And then in the preaching, and then there's oil. Then we can glorify God. And then when the pastor was saying this, one person came up and then... Uh, uh, Excuse me, I'm trying to think back what happened. Um, that I think it's one person, he, he just said, oh, there's oil in my, in my Bible. But the tone of voice shows that he's not really surprised. You know, when you say, wow, when, when you see there's oil there, they will say, wow, I found oil in my Bible too. It, it would respond like that. But this person came out and then he said to the pastor, look, no, he, he was, he stand up, he stood up where he was. He just stood up. There's oil in my Bible. There was no excitement. There's no sign of surprise. So I, I was curious, was it because the pastor does it every week or often? And then people would do that to the Bible too, to bring back and then say, wow, look at my Bible, it has oil. Uh, I want to say if it's real from God, glory to God. It's great, wonderful. I believe God can do things like this. But if it's not real, don't do something like that because this is lying. God hates it. It's not only not doing anything good, it's doing destruction to our life. And so don't ever do this. And also, if anything happens, any miracle happens, we always say, thank God, hallelujah, it's God is wonderful. Always, uh, you know, it's not just thank God, but to say God is wonderful. God is powerful. God has mercy upon us. Oh, thank you. We are nothing, but you are everything. You are powerful. So emphasize we are nothing, but you can do great things for God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.